Good evening, everyone. Today we are finishing up the lecture series for Astro 322. Uh, I want to get going on the idea of galaxy evolution. Now, this kind of brings together everything that we have talked about in the course, but we need to sort of then inject it into what we like to call is the cosmological context. And so we actually have to learn a little bit of cosmology to understand how galaxy evolution actually works. So this uh, talk is kind of broken down where we're going to talk about uh, the dark matter. We've sort of dealt with dark matter all the way through this course, and now we really need to sort of focus a bit on its subject, uh, on it as a subject. We're going to do a very brief introduction to cosmology, leaving an entire course in your future to explore it in more detail. We'll talk about the cosmic microwave background and how that sets the stage for galaxy evolution. Uh, then we'll talk about actual galaxy evolution and sort of link things together to kind of take all of the ideas that we've sort of dealt with uh, in individuals and connect them up into kind of a single coherent idea. So um, let's get started with the idea of dark matter. Now, dark matter... For all of this time, we've spent most of the course focusing on what stars and gas and galaxies do, but ultimately the important thing is dark, uh, dark matter. Dark matter really sets how things evolve in the universe. There is eight times as much dark matter as baryonic matter, and so we need to understand its properties to understand the galaxies that we see. The things we know about dark matter is that dark matter is cold, non-collisional, and non-interacting. So um, when we say cold, we mean that the velocity dispersion of dark matter particles, and we think that they are particles for reasons we'll get into, uh, is about 300 kilometers per second, typically for a Milky Way-like uh, galaxy. Uh, this is critically nowhere near C. This is a thousandth of the speed of light. When we think about the ideas of hot or warm dark matter, these are things that are approaching relativistic speeds. But we don't think that's what dark matter is. We think that dark matter is nice and cold. Uh, we think that dark matter is non-collisional. So we think that the particles of dark matter don't have any friction or viscosity or anything if they flow through each other. So dark matter doesn't seem to interact with itself, and it doesn't seem to interact with anything else except through the action of gravity. There are no known interactions of dark matter with regular matter except with gravity. Now, it is quite the industry of physics research here at the University of Alberta in particular to hope for certain types of dark matter that does have a very low probability interaction with matter. This is a hope. And we really would like to constrain it, because if we don't see dark matter, then we start to expect it, mu it must be a different type of particle. So we're trying to predict types of particles and look for things that very weakly interact. But so far, to date, no evidence of interaction, except through gravity. Some of the best constraints on what dark matter is actually come from a single astronomical observation. This is the bullet cluster. Uh, these are actually two clusters of galaxies that are observed. And this is a interesting multicolor image. So what has happened is two galaxies have collided with each other and kind of slammed into each other and passed through. There's one cluster here on the left and one cluster here on the right. Now, we learned in the last chapter that in a galaxy cluster, most of the baryonic matter there is made of the hot X-ray intercluster medium. And so that's shown here colored in the red. And we know that gas is collisional. So when it collide, when these two clusters collide, the gas splats into each other and makes a nice uh, sort, of, uh, sort of splatted pancake of gas here in the center, but we're observing this cluster after that collision has occurred, and we see two um, clusters that are separated. And we know that the stars in the systems and the galaxies are themselves non-collisional, so they have just passed right through the, um, through the cluster. And then uh, we have the clusters here. So the, they passed through the collision, and now they are well separated, and then we have the gases splatted into each other. 
Then the other thing we have to remember is that the baryonic matter in the galaxy is mostly in this hot cluster emitting gas or hot X-ray emitting gas. That's this stuff. So all the material, all the baryonic matter in the cluster, or like 90% of it, is here in this gas. But over here is where the galaxies have gone. And we also know that this is where the dark matter has gone. So what this study has done is it is making small observations of tiny galaxies beyond it. You can sort of see them in this image here. And what you're seeing is that they undergo slight gravitational torques or shears that allow them to sort of appear as gravitationally lensed objects. And the strength of the lenses uh, here allow us to map out where the dark matter is. And the dark matter traces where the tiny amount of stellar matter is. Specifically, it's not that it's the stellar matter, it's the non-colliding matter. And so what happened here is we had two ordinary clusters of galaxies with dark matter and gas and galaxies in them. And when they hit each other, all the gas stayed in the middle of the collision and all of the galaxies and the dark matter passed on through. And that tells us that the dark matter is like the galaxies. Specifically, it is non-collisional and it doesn't interact with itself. This also tells us that it behaves a lot like a particle. It is not simply tracing where the matter is. Uh, and so if you had a theory, like if you said we had to modify gravity to explain the existence of dark matter, this is often called modified Newtonian dynamics, you would think that all of the so-called dark matter would be hanging out here with the X-ray emitting gas. But we don't see that. What we do see is that it is moving non-collisionally and just kind of passing through uh, here. So that's where the dark matter is. It's a non-collisional particle and it doesn't behave like it's just tracing ordinary matter. It's not, it's moving separate from ordinary matter. Anyways, so that tells us that dark matter is cold it is non-interacting because it's dark and it's not collisional so it doesn't collide with itself it gives us everything we need to know so we think that it is well explained by being a weakly interacting massive particle so these wimps uh, are what we conjecture are the behavior we just don't know the properties of them but every th line of evidence we have is that it behaves like a light massive particle typically with a, a behaving like a gas with a velocity dispersion of 300 kilometers per second. And it's like 85% of the universe or 88% of the mass in the universe is this dark matter. And we just don't know what it is. So dark matter is one thing in the universe. And now what we have to do, and, and the important thing is it's the most important form of matter. We just don't know much about it, which is you know, problematic. Uh, but we do our best nonetheless. And so we need to now say, given dark matter, let's try to understand the evolution of galaxies in the context of the universe. So to do that, we need to understand the universe. Uh, studying the behavior of the universe, its evolution over the course of its lifetime is the study of cosmology. Here at the University of Alberta, that's Astro 430 is the course. So I'm gonna defer a lot of that to that course. But we do know uh, a few things that are going to help us out, and we need to kind of arm ourselves with some tools here. First, uh, from the Hubble law analysis we did last time, we made the claim and sort of uh, said that observations back up the idea that the universe is uniformly expanding on its largest scales. Where objects are self-gravitating, they decouple from this so-called Hubble flow, uh, and they uh, exist like our local group and individual galaxies are not participating in cosmic expansion, but the universe on largest scales is. And we also knew that we could sort of model this as the separation between this, uh, non self gravitating galaxies can be considered in terms of their separation now. And I'm going to give that a specific variable, d naught. That's often called the co-moving distance between objects, is their current separation now. And we're going to fix the time now to give t naught. And so whenever we see a zero, that usually refers to cosmology now. Okay. So we said that the uniform, uh, the uh, galaxy, the universe, higher and higher scales, the universe is expanding. 
And so we can say that there is a given distance now, our co-moving distance. We're going to figure out a distance in the past or alternatively in the future uh, by uh, calculating what's called a scale factor, which is called A of t. And so A of t is uh, basically the scale of the universe, and it ranges from 0 at the beginning to 1 right now. And so we define a of t naught to be 1, and so we say that the scale factor is just uh, the current co-moving distance times the scale factor a of t. Uh, we also know that the scale of the universe is traced by the redshift of the light that we're observing. So when we're dealing with observations, we invariably represent the scale factor of the universe as the... Um, wavelength uh, or in terms of the observed redshift and describe scale factor in terms of 1 over 1 plus z. And this is an observationally driven uh, definition. The scale factor is really a of t and we just remember that that's 1 over 1 plus z throughout but we'll usually quote everything in terms of z's. Uh, finally, in terms of the uh, rate of the expansion, that's the important thing, uh, the rate of the expansion is the time derivative of that scale factor. And if we compare the time derivative of the scale factor to the scale factor, this will have a dimension of per unit time. So that's uh, some value uh, changing in time versus some value will give us the uh, Hubble constant. And we say that h is actually formally a function of t, but what we quoted last time, which was about 71 kilometers per second per megaparsec, that is h naught. That's the Hubble constant now recognizing that that value could change. So with all of that as definitions, let's actually look at what the scale factor of the universe does. This is a model of the current uh, best estimate of what our universe's cosmology is doing. And so this is a scale factor, as promised, it ranges from zero to one uh, here over the course of time, from zero to almost 14 billion years here. So that's what we think the scale factor of the universe is doing, and it's gonna actually keep on going up in this direction. Here I've plotted one over one plus uh, the scale factor, and so that gives me the uh, redshift. Uh, so, sorry, it's one minus one over a. Uh, this is the redshift here, so we can see the correspondence uh, that 1 over 1 plus z will give us uh, the value here on the right. So at redshift 1, the scale factor is 0 0.5. Okay, so um, this is the trajectory of the universe, and it's almost a straight line. Um, this is kind of a peculiar behavior. It's a not expected uh, at all. We think that the universe is, if we just had matter in it, would be uh, slowing down because it's essentially the gravity of the universe as a whole would decelerate it as it's expanding. But the fact that it's sort of changing concavity and in fact is starting to accelerate, that's a sign of the cosmological constant in the universe, sometimes called dark energy uh, in the universe. Uh, one of the major breakthroughs and discoveries of the past 20 years, um, and we are not gonna say too much about it because it's a different course. Uh, but uh, there is this expansion to the scale of the universe. And this blue trajectory is uh, what we actually see. So it's almost a straight line. And so when we're considering uh, the straight line, we can actually try to infer what the age in the universe is. And what we do is we consider the slope of this curve and extrapolate it backwards. And that's the red dashed line here, or pink dashed line here. And that is, the slope is the Hubble constant. So one over the Hubble constant uh, will give me a dimension of time. And that's essentially the red line shown here. And that's the tangent approximation that runs back and hits, in fact, slightly before zero, which tells us that our estimate of the Hubble time is a little bit longer than the true age of the universe. Uh, also note that the slope of this curve is the Hubble constant um, at different times. And so the Hubble constant was uh, large at the beginning and it sort of has stayed somewhat steady and then um, 
uh, is, you know, roughly constant over there the past while. And that was the discover. That's how they discovered the presence of dark energy was they measured the cosmic expansion at, in high redshift systems and inferred that the, um, uh, the universe was not slowing down as expected. So the Hubble time is this sort of tangent line approximation uh, we call TH is 1 over H naught, and you can calculate that out. And it comes out to be about 14 billion years for the values that uh, we gave you. Uh, and if you sort of actually do this extrapolation, you find uh, that given the actual cosmology of the universe, the true age of the universe is about 13.5. We don't worry too much about the difference. We will often just slip into the language to say, oh, it's about a Hubble time, in meaning uh, oh, that's about the age of the universe, but it's uh, not actually quite the same uh, value here. Okay. So that's how the universe is uh, expanding with time. We've done a lot of measurements to sort of predict this model. Uh, it's a consequence straight out of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, uh, given the constants. Um, it is almost simple if you then sort of realize, that, you know, which is a dumb statement to make because relativity is anything but simple, but it is a fairly, the universe on the largest scales is a relatively simple system relativistically. So we can figure out how to, um, you know, compute its evolution in a fairly straightforward fashion. So we don't truly care about the universe on large scales. I mean, we do, but not for purposes of this class. What we care about is the behavior of the stuff inside it. And inside it, we have two things. We have, well, we have three things. We have dark energy, uh, which we're not going to talk about. We have matter, and then we also have radiation. That's like light and everything. And what's uh, interesting about the idea that we have an expanding universe is that that means that the actual densities of stuff in the universe on an average scale are changing over the course of time. So if you think about it, if we actually increase the scale of the universe, but we leave matter the same, what that's going to mean is that the density of matter is decreasing over time. And you can sort of figure out that if A is the scale factor of the universe, the density of matter is going to go like 1 over A cubed, because A cubed is volume. And so that's the... Um, the uh, changing volume of the universe, same amount of matter, volume is getting larger over time, so density will decrease over time, like the scale factor cube. And here's the density, or the scale factor, so you can actually figure out what the average density of the universe is doing over time. That's ah, pretty cool. And so uh, then you can ask, well, what about the radiation in the universe? Well, uh, radiation, when you expand it or contract it in a volume adiabatically, ends up having a different scaling with the volume. Specifically, in terms of the scale factor, it scales like 1 over a to the fourth not third, and you can roughly mentally bookkeep this in terms of there's three powers for the volume, and then there's one extra power for the redshift, where the radiation is uh, sort of being stretched out and decreasing. That's not thermodynamically the best way of thinking about it, but it's not a bad way for us to uh, store it in our heads. Anyways, uh, so we can look and say, well, if we go back in time, the density is going up, but the temperature will go up by a larger power. And since we know that the radiation energy density scales like the temperature of the fourth power, uh, a la the Stefan Boltzmann law and other things, we actually figure out the mean temperature of the universe, which is uh, current temperature of the universe in the radiation field times one plus z. That's that extra uh, power uh, of or the alignment of the sort of scale factors with uh, 1 plus z and the temperature of the fourth and the scale factor of the fourth, it all comes out. Uh, so it just, as the we look to higher redshifts, the mean temperature of the universe is higher by exactly that factor, which is one of the reasons why redshift is such a convenient unit. Okay. And then we can measure the current temperature of the universe, which is about 2.725 Kelvin. It's kind of amazing. Um, that to actually say that. So this is roughly, this is, if you go out into the universe and you just stick up a thermometer, you're far away from literally everything, there's no matter around you, and you just measure the temperature of the radiation field, this is the value you get. And what's amazing about this 
is that it is uh, truly thermal. And one of the great Nobel Prize winning discoveries in uh, astrophysics was the measurement of the black body temperature of the universe. This is an old uh, mission from the 1990s called the COBE mission, the Cosmic Background Explorer. And uh, it is showing the uh, black body spectrum of the universe. So these individual points here are the uh, measured radiation field of the universe. And this is a 2.75 Kelvin black body. Uh, what's amazing about this from an experimental perspective is this thing right here. This is data with 400 sigma error bars. So these error bars have been blown up by a factor of 400 just to show you the error bars. This curve goes right through the black body radiation. And so to make black body radiation, you need to have something that is hot and opaque. You need to have the radiation be in thermodynamic equilibrium with the rest of the universe. And this represents one of the major lines of evidence to say that the, Earth, the universe was once in a hot, dense state, which was dismissively referred to back in the day as being undergoing a Big Bang. But of course, now we say that this is the cosmology that we live in, uh, is the Big Bang cosmology. But anyways, for our purposes, what we care about is that there's radiation in the universe and it has a temperature of 2.725 Kelvin, which means that if you go from here back to about a redshift of mm, 1100, then what you start to see is that you get to temperatures closing in on about 3000 Kelvin. And 3000 Kelvin is an interesting value. Uh, because in sort of the densities of the universe at that time, 3000 Kelvin represents the time when hydrogen gas would undergo a recombination. It would go from a plasma state to a neutral state. And so if you think about the universe getting hotter and hotter and hotter in it earlier and earlier times, uh, that means that the earliest stage in the universe would be hot and ionized because it's super hot. And then if it's cooling down as redshift, uh, as you know, it, as we come closer in redshift, as we uh, consider a farther time advancing, it's going to cool on down and eventually that hydrogen will recombine. And so this is a little infographic from the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe uh, team. Uh, and it's sort of showing that, okay, we have a time axis and a temperature axis. And we're thinking about us here looking back in time and sort of seeing, uh, you know, looking far away, which is looking back in time because of the light travel time. And we sort of see when we look back, the universe is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. At about 3000 Kelvin, the universe transitions to an ionized state or moving forward in time. Uh, we go through, um, you know, all these deep cosmology uh, issues like uh, end of inflation, uh, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which creates the elemental abundance we see today. We see thermalization of the radiation field. And then uh, as we get to about 3000 Kelvin, which is that redshift of 1100 or so, uh, all of the plasma in the universe uh, is going to recombine. So. What you should have in your head is the universe is expanding and cooling off and expanding and cooling off. And it's basically like the interior of a star. And eventually it expands and cools off enough that it can undergo recombination following the same recombination physics uh, equations that we have from the um, uh, H2 region studies. And so at this level where it goes through 3000 Kelvin, the universe critically goes from being ionized and opaque to being hydrogen and transparent, or neutral hydrogen and transparent. Because we know that a neutral hydrogen atom doesn't do much absorbing of uh, light. It absorbs at, you know, the 121.6 nanometers for a Lyman alpha, or uh, uh, if it's in the n equals two state, it'll absorb at 656 nanometers for a uh, H alpha photon. It's only very specific uh, spectral transitions, but most of the light 
in the universe will then flow through this suddenly transparent hydrogen. Inside a star or in the early universe, ionized gas is opaque. Those free electrons are undergoing Thomson cross-section scattering. There's all this stuff that's blocking the light that is stopping the radiation from flowing through the universe readily. Uh, and then suddenly, globally, all of these photons are bouncing around and then globally the universe recombines and then those photons are free to flow in whatever direction they were going last, which is why this is called the surface of last scattering cosmologically. So this transition from ionized gas to neutral gas uh, is a going forward in time. It's called recombination, but that's a misnomer because it is combination. The uh, atoms have never been combined before. These are the first atoms in the universe, and they form everywhere in the universe, mostly all at once. And so this is a map from the Planck satellite showing the um, cos map of the cosmic microwave background. So this is radiation. What they've done is they've gone out and they have simply mapped the temperature of the universe across the entire sky. This is the galactic plane here, which they have very carefully removed through a series of painstaking techniques. And then uh, you can sort of see North and South galactic poles, and it looks like a bunch of little bumps. And what you're seeing here is the temperatures of the black body radiation. Blue is the colder radiation, and then red is the warmer radiation. So it's kind of backwards from, you know, space. But anyways, uh, the these colder um, regions here are uh, signs that we see these slight deviations. And these slight deviations are slight. Remember I said it was a 2.725 Kelvin black body spectrum. The amplitudes of the fluctuations are at the hundreds to smaller micro Kelvin. So these are, it's ultra precise, and then there are these tiny fluctuations on top of it that we see here. And these are important for galaxy evolution. Specifically, if we look at the warmer regions, warmer regions are slightly under dense uh, at the time, uh, uh, during the process of recombination. Uh, and so we see that the universe is not actually uniform at the time of recombination just slight inhomogeneities. And this map is showing you the magnitude of those inhomogeneities. These warmer regions were slightly less dense. And it, you remember that recombination depends on the density of the gas. So it's slightly less dense. And so it actually has to wait a little while longer and cool off before it recombines. Therefore, the radiation comes out and leaves the surface of last scattering a little warmer. The stuff here in the blue spot are regions which were a little bit denser, and that little over density means that it recombined a little faster because it goes like the density squared, and therefore the light has had longer period of time to be redshifted and stretched out, and so it appears a little cooler. Everything kind of recombines at about 3000 Kelvin. It just depends on the relative densities as to whether it comes out. So the radiation field starts at 3000 Kelvin and then gets shifted. But these are tiny fluctuations. And the importance of that tiny fluctuations is that uh, it allows us to kind of map out the sort of small density fluctuations in the universe at a redshift of 1100. Well, those tiny little density fluctuations at a redshift of 1100 have a specific scale. And if you look at them, you'd be like, oh, is this, this, this seems like there are these sort of fixed patterns of bumps here. And that could just be the resolution. That's the static of the instrument, but it's not. Planck actually had really good resolution. These bumps have a very specific kind of scale to them. And the way we measure that is in a graph that looks like this. This is a plot of essentially the amount of light that is found on a specific angular scale. And most of the size of the bumps on that uh, image here have a size of about one degree on the sky. So that's about here. You can read the angular scale. 
This is typically plotted in multipoles here, so that's why it's shown here. Uh, if you've done quantum mechanics, uh, this is basically a spherical harmonic decomposition of the uh, surface of the sphere. You know, those are the orthonormal uh, functions on the surface of a sphere. Uh, and so this is basically measuring the power in the different YLM spherical harmonics. For our purposes, that just means that there's a lot of power at one degree and not as much on either side of it. There's a very characteristic size to that, but there are some other structures in the sky that have this sort of pattern. There's a bump at around 0.2 degrees, a bump at around 0.5 degrees. And so the dots are the actual data. The line that goes through them is a model. That model is uh, determined by the cosmology of the universe plus one or two other things. So these are some cosmological parameters that are talking about how the universe is expanding. There's some other things in there like the number of families of neutrinos that there are. It's three. Stop looking. Uh, and all those other things that are important for um the universe there's only a few parameters like six or seven independent parameters here and one of them is sigma eight uh sigma eight is called the standard deviation of matter fluctuations on eight megaparsec scales and for the purposes of galaxy evolution this is one of the most important parameters because it essentially says how big are these over and under densities in the universe? Because this is how things begin. This is functionally how the dark matter is disturbed from a truly uniform universe. And once you start making a disturbance and have slightly over dense and under dense regions, gravity kicks in and it pulls matter into the over dense regions at the expense of the under dense regions leaving stuff behind uh, or sort of gathering stuff out and leaving empty space behind sigma 8 tells us at 11 redshift of 1100 way back 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe how far along gravitational collapse is and we can take that as the initial conditions to understand how galaxies evolve. So we take and we essentially seed our uh, analysis by saying uh, or the dark matter in the universe has a small set of fluctuations with this kind of sigma 8 parameter uh, that determines how big those fluctuations are. And then we start a bunch, uh, we can simulate that by either analytically or what I'm going to show you numerically, simulating a bunch of dark matter particles that have those deviations and then you turn them loose under the action of self-gravity. Uh, so what I will show is actually some simulations. Um, the dark matter ends up gathering into structures that are called halos. Uh, like the dark matter halos of galaxies. And I will note here that some of those halos can have some spin or angular momentum to them, and some of them can be relatively low angular momentum. And this is going to end up controlling whether you get a material falling into it, both dark matter and or gas, which is following the dark matter along. And does it form with high angular momentum in a disk-like structure or low angular momentum in a spheroidal structure? This is dictated by how those dark matter particles come together. Let's take a look at that through a simulation that's called the Illustra simulation here. Uh, this is a volume of the universe. Uh, it is uh, shown here. Uh, and this is the structure of dark matter in the universe after I've taken a bunch of dark matter particles, put them in a box, given them a known sigma eight fluctuation at uh, redshift of 1100 and then let them kind of fall together and they form out this filamentary structure. I'm going to turn on the actual simulation here. Actually, let's go back and look at that without my scale bar. No. Oh, yeah. What you're seeing down here is... What you're seeing in the bottom is the redshift. This thing right here is the redshift, and this is the amount of material that's found in stars at that redshift. And so what it will do, oh, 
is actually run through. And see, it starts at redshift 11 or 10. And what you're seeing is the dark matter flowing together, is sort of spinning around, and collecting under the action of its gravity. There is no physics in here except for dark matter particles and gravity started out with the initial conditions that we know from the beginning of the universe uh, through cosmic microwave background. And that starts to build up this structure. It's very simple structure. It looks almost like tree roots, or sometimes you can see why this is called the cosmic web. All of this matter is gathering down here. And again, I'll stretch this rich get richer phenomenon where massive structures have gravity that pulls the material into them uh, gathering up and becoming larger, having more gravity, gathering more stuff into it. So the general action of matter in the universe is to fall down. Dark matter has no physics to speak of. It just falls down under the action of gravity and it forms the structures like this. And amazingly, it looks a lot like the large scale structure of the universe. So the, what we see here are long filaments of galaxies we see large halos, that's where clusters form. Smaller uh, groups of halos here are where groups form. And then it leaves behind large volumes here that we call the voids. And so this is the general structure of the universe. And we can see that in a similar simulation here, which is uh, the, basically the same physics uh, done on different stills. It's a slightly higher resolution, two-dimensional rendering. And this is just showing this from uh, farther back, from eight, Redshift 8.10.3, all the way through to the present day. We see material just sort of flowing into these uh, filamentary networks uh, here. And so this is a big galaxy, third, uh, big galaxy cluster, 31 megaparsecs side to side. You see all these other little galaxy clusters here, and you can watch them, how they kind of get built up by dark matter flowing almost through these corridors or highways of material, these filaments down and gathering into progressively larger structure. Okay, so this gives us a sense of how material is actually building up over the course of the universe. We can then run statistics and start to analyze these halos, and we find that they are well represented by a function uh, that looks a lot like the Schechter function. And what you see here is a plot of the number density of halos per cubic megaparsec compared to the Schechter luminosity function uh, as a function of those halo masses from redshift 50 here all the way up to about redshift zero. And what you see is that this power law tail kind of emerges here. And then you have something analogous to kind of that L star turnover, where there's an exponential cutoff that has just, there is, the universe has not had time to make objects more massive than about 10 to the 15 solar masses here. It is progressively getting larger and larger. There's this kind of scale-free power law tail below that threshold. And over the course of time, we just kind of fill up to this steady state power law line and this mass scale progressively gets larger and larger and larger as the universe goes on this is representing the scale of the unit or the scale of halos in the universe getting larger and larger as material dark matter flows into them and the gas and galaxies just come along for the ride. Dark matter says where galaxies form. It says which galaxies are larger than other galaxies, just because the dark matter is pulling more matter in, and the galaxies are just the response to the dark matter potential collapsing. If we compare that uh, dark matter simulation with all that filamentary structure to what we see in galaxies, we see basically the same thing. Uh, this is the 2DF redshift survey. Uh, we worked with it last week in the homework. And what we're seeing here is all these little voids. We see the filaments. We see the clusters as these kind of radial structures here. Every one of these uh, sort of 
uh, structures here is exactly dictated by the dark matter around it. So what we're seeing is that galaxies follow dark matter and indeed trace out where the dark matter is, but they are not the dominant reason why they're there. They're kind of the running lights, if you will, of the dark matter ships as they sort of are flowing down under the action of gravity. The galaxies come along for the ride and are showing you where the dark matter actually is. But that's somewhat unsatisfying because really what we care about are the galaxies themselves. Dark matter is telling us where they form, how big they are, all that stuff. But we really want to then tie that uh, cosmology through the dark matter context down to what the gas in the galaxy is doing and, uh, and the gas in the stars in the galaxy is doing. So we can start to think about how the physics of the actual baryons in the universe respond to this cosmological context. So we want to remind ourselves a bit about gas. So remember, after recom uh, reionization, uh, yeah, sorry, after recombination at the beginning of the universe, redshift 1100, all of the gas is in a relatively cool, neutral state. And then uh, what we see is that that gas collapses down and somehow forms the first generation of stars. We'll come back to this because it's kind of cutting edge stuff at the end of the uh, at the end of this video, but. The important thing is that somehow that gas collapses down following uh, the action of uh, the dark matter, it collapses down, it forms stars in dark matter halos, igniting the first galaxies, and those early high mass stars end up reionizing the universe. So it comes uh, and the universe is expanding, its density is dropping off, and so the feedback from these earliest stars ends up reionizing the universe. And since, once again, recombination depends on the density of the material, if this happens in a much lower density state, that ionized galaxy, that ionized universe will not go ahead and recombine. And it will get quite hot. The ionization uh, will heat up the gas and it can make the gas in between galaxies quite warm. At this point, I want to remind you uh, this is an image in the cosmological constant of the cooling constant lambda as a function of temperature. And these are for different metallicities, 10 to the minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, and minus 6. So we would be minus 2 here because this is a cosmology study. We start at 10 to the minus 3. And for gas at a fixed pressure, the cooling time uh, scales like the temperature squared over the cooling function. And so this is the cooling function here. And you can see that as gas gets hot, that cooling function is relatively constant. You know, there's a spread of a order of magnitude or so, uh, but it scales like the temperature squared. So this hot gas here can actually be, have an incredibly long giggy year level cooling time uh, up here. So this means if we get those high mass stars ionizing and creating a very hot gas, all that stuff out there in and low densities is not going to cool down very readily. To cool down, you need to pull it up to increase its pressure by sort of putting into a gravity well and having it fall down into a galaxy. And then once you do that, it's a bit of a runaway process where it gets quite strong cooling around the temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin through the process of uh, cooling lines like the, uh, the recombination lines of hydrogen and through the process of recombination and then through neutral ISM cooling here like what we studied back in the ISM chapter. But the point here is this, that hot gas in between galaxies is going to be at very low pressure and high temperatures, so it's going to stay hot. You have to bring stuff into galaxies to cool it down. And the reason why this is important is we want to actually understand where all the gas in the galaxies and the universe is right now. And the answer is not in galaxies. Um, in fact, of that tiny, you know, part, you know, there's eight times as much dark matter as regular matter. And of the regular matter, 
Only 7% of that is found in galaxies in the form of stars, and only 2% is for in, the found in the form of uh, neutral gas. So that's barely 10% of the material in the universe is in neutral gas and stars. The rest of it is ionized gas. Uh, a lot of it is around galaxies it, in clusters, but uh, most of the material seems to be stuck out there in between the uh, galaxies and their dark matter halos, slowly falling in, getting compressed, and turning into stars. So most of the universe uh, is baryons are outside of galaxies, and they're being gathered up slowly by the cosmic web and being funneled in. So I'm going to come back to that illustrious simulation that we looked at earlier, and we're going to look at it again. What this is, is we looked at what the dark matter was doing over here. This panel over here on the right is showing what's happening to the gas temperature. So remember, the dark matter is gathering up the material, and then the gas is responding to that. It is gathering, the, or it is uh, being compressed down, cooling down, and forming stars. So that is uh, what happens in uh, these individual uh, galaxy halos here. So what we want to do is pay attention to how those galaxies form over the course of the uh, universe going here from, this is at redshift 1.65. This plots time since the Big Bang, four billion years, and the stellar mass in billions of solar masses. So uh, we can sort of keep track as the redshift drops, the time increases, and the stellar mass uh, also increases inside the simulation volume. So let's give it a go. Okay, so again, the dark matter starts out, and there's no matter sort of in the gas here. It sort of collapses down into the dark matter halos and gets gathered into galaxies where stellar feedback ends up heating up the material. So you can see these little islands of heat uh, starting to get warmed up as material flows into the galaxies. And you start to see a separation in uh, the temperatures. You see at the very centers of galaxies, things are quite blue, quite cold. Uh, but then around them, you see the action of stellar feedback and active galactic nuclei as things are heating up and blowing up and heating the material around them. So you see these little explosions. Uh, those are active galactic nuclei kicking off. Uh, the cold gas is sort of around this, so gas flows down, it gets cold, it flows into the AGN, which then drive heating out in other directions. So you see uh, the galaxies heating up the universe around them, sort of tracing out this filament, uh, these filaments. And so there's the cycle of the material getting heated, uh, compressed back, uh, falling down the filaments again, uh, being formed into cold gas phase. But this is just showing you where the hot gas in the universe is. It's everywhere. It, it started out hot from the first ionizations uh, in the universe, and it is maintained at high temperatures uh, through feedback. This stuff that's flowing out here into the cosmic voids and everything, it's not going to cool off over the course of uh, the universe. So uh, yeah, this is uh, a wonderful uh, simulation here. So we're going to take a little pause and just watch it go. I just like seeing all those little blue flecks of those cold gas inside individual galaxies. And then you can see the AGN blasting the material out into uh, space in these big feedback shells. Over here on the dark matter side, doesn't care about anything. Just keeps on keeps on collapsing. But here we are. This is our hot, ionized, uh, intergalactic, and intercluster media. All right. The Illustrious team does some amazing visualizations, so uh, thanks to them and all their hard work for making a complicated process of uh, galaxy evolution into something really uh, pretty to see. This is another simulation that goes farther back. Uh, this goes back to a redshift of 16. And what this is tracking or trying to track 
is the first generations of stars and how they kind of light up and ionize a neutral universe. Uh, so this is the Thesan simulations. And what we're seeing here, this kind of popcorn, is uh, the very early universe is dense and neutral. And these are stars that are um, sort of lighting up here. And the point that they are trying to make with the simulation is that uh, eventually, the ionization of stars wins over the tendency for the universe to recombine. And we d end up with a overall dominant universe that is, you know, in toto ionized. Uh, but this is sh showing the balance where we have, you know, at the beginning, you ionize something and it recombines, but the density of the universe is dropping. And so over the course of time, the forces of ionization win. And uh, so right now we're sort of running through, you know, that was just a uh, 3D map uh, around the universe. And now this is sort of uh, ionizing away the last of the neutral gas in the universe till we arrive at the overall ionized universe we see today. The kind of nerve tissue stuff that you see here as we're going through it, what they're showing is really where the um, hot gas and uh, the sort of, you know, I guess the the hot gas is in the uh, universe, in, sorry, in the simulation volume. Uh, but, you know, overall the dark stuff here is the neutral. So, yeah, we uh, undergo this fundamental change in kind of the topology of ionization in the universe uh, shown through this kind of transition of neutral to ionized gas. Wow. So that summarizes a lot of what we uh, sort of understand about how galaxies are evolving. And we can start to track and measure what's happening over the course of time, because star formation actually is important. It drives the ionization, it drives the feedback that we're observing in these galaxies. And we can ask, well, how much star formation is there in the universe? And uh, the what's happening, all this gas is flowing into galaxies, can we measure how much the how active those galaxies are in building up their mass? And the answer is, well, yes, of course we can. Uh, this is one of the fundamental plots in studies of galaxy evolution. This is the plot of the star formation density in the universe as a function of redshift or look back time across the top axis here. And what it shows is we are actually in a boring part of the uh, universe. We call this part of the universe, this is called cosmic noon. And at redshift 2, we have a ton of star formation going on. All the material is getting packed from gas into stars at about redshift 2. This is where galaxies are building up most of their mass uh, in the universe. So it's 10 times higher star formation density. So a galaxy like the Milky Way would be 10 times as active in terms of star formation uh, 10 billion years ago compared to what we see today. So this is called cosmic noon. And then at that point, it kind of tapers off and rolls over. There's some debate uh, as to what's happening out here. More on that in like six slides. Uh, but uh, what we're seeing in this kind of turnover is that this state is we start off with a little bit of star formation in the universe and time proceeds forward this way. Uh, the star formation in galaxies uh, reaches an apex at about redshift 2 and then it has been falling off. So this is cosmic dawn. Uh, this is cosmic noon. And I don't know, I guess we're cosmic evening or cosmic happy hour down here. Uh, but yeah, we have passed the peak of star formation here in the universe. This is important because it's telling us when most galaxies are building up their mass. This is the process by which galaxies grow. It happened mostly at redshift 2. Uh, a little bit happened over here. A little bit is happening down here where we are, here at redshift 0. Uh, but, you know, it was 10 billion years ago is when we made almost all the galaxies. And surprise, surprise, the Milky Way built up most of its mass about that time too. So, yeah, it's good to... Uh, good to see the picture kind of connecting because this is through the buildup of some mass through star formation. This is actually how galaxies are building. But I've kind of made a uh, 
connection here. I've implied a connection, and you might ask, well, is it there? Because I've said that the mass of galaxies is tracking dark matter halos, uh, and the gas just falls along with dark matter. Uh, and you can say, okay, well, do I actually, um, you know, believe it? Like, are all massive halos lead to more massive galaxies? Uh, certainly, I have implied that. And yes, but the relationship isn't quite as simple as we might think. Um, this is a plot of the mass function of galaxies here in the uh, little x's here. And so we are a couple times 10 to the 10 solar mass galaxy right here. And this follows a Schechter-like profile where there's a you know steeper section and then kind of an exponential turnover. And then the most massive galaxies hang out here at about 10 to the 12 or something like that. Uh, there's quite a bit of uncertainty as what's going on over here. What's interesting is that there's this dashed line here. And this dashed line is that same halo mass function that I plotted. And you'll notice that they're not the same shape. This is the halo mass function. This is the galaxy mass function. And around 10, a few times 10 to the 10, they're quite close. You basically have maximal halos. Uh, you, these halos here at a few times 10 to the 10 solar masses have managed to gather their mass of stars and basically grown the galaxies inside them to be as you know close to the mass of the halo as they can get. But as those galaxies are larger, grow larger, something about their, uh, you know, their star formation causes them to stop. The halo keeps growing, but something about the halo uh, makes it so it isn't as efficient at building up stars. And the mass of galaxies caps out at 10 to the 12, but the mass of halos caps out at a thousand times that much. And this is the process of quenching. So this is probably the process of like AGN feedback. It could be that the halos get so massive that as the material falls into it, it gets hot and uh, can't actually cool down and form stars. Any of those quenching theories explains roughly why this turns over and there's basically a maximum mass to galaxies that's set by the halos. The lower end is not something that we quite uh, explained yet. Because um, these aren't quenched systems. These are actively star-forming systems. These are low-mass, blue, uh, star-forming uh, main-sequence galaxies. And their halos are just a lot larger compared to, say, their uh, these you know, higher-mass galaxies. The halos are a lot larger. And the reason why we think this is happening is that the um, deficit there is the, because of star formation feedback these tiny little galaxies can't actually hold on to the matter that gets ejected by stars. They essentially form a generation of stars and then supernova explosions are enough to unbind the gas from the galaxy and throw it out uh, side of the halo. And so these galaxies are somewhat inefficient. And so it's galaxies like the Milky Way or slightly less massive than the Milky Way. Those are the systems that are most efficient at forming stars in the universe. And so feedback through either star formation or through AGN and quenching is what's explaining why the galaxy mass function doesn't quite perfectly trace the halo mass function. So there's a correlation, but the actual physics of the matter is determining whether you are growing a galaxy efficiently inside the halo or not. All right. So we're going to come back and we're going to look at that same illustrious simulation again. Uh, but this time, uh, as we're sort of looking at this, we're going to be inside of this and looking in more detail at the actual structure of the feedback here. And you can really see these dark matter halos growing here. I'm actually going to speed it up a bit. We've seen this a couple times. Uh, but I want to focus on the action of feedback here. Again, you see that beautiful zoom in of the blue cold gas. You see the feedback, the flickering that you see here are AGN duty cycles. Uh, starbursts are what are blowing out these big uh, explosions uh, of matter in the galaxy. So you can see feedback 
is the second order effect that shapes what galaxy population we get. So first effect is dark matter. Big halos make big galaxies. Second effect is feedback, which basically controls how quickly you can make a galaxy inside of a halo. So I just wanted to sort of show that on cosmological zoom in so that we could see in a little more detail what this is looking like. Uh, they're changing the visualization at this point in the movie. They're sort of highlighting different colors and temperatures of gas. Uh, so you can sort of see where the uh, different phases are and what these galaxies would look like under different observational tracers. I don't know. I think it's you know pretty phenomenal to actually see our best representation of what the universe looks like uh, at different times as the system evolves. Well, back to dark matter. This is again showing the halos growing together. Here's something like the bullet cluster splashing together and merging, coming out the other side. Uh, so you can really see, uh, I don't know, just uh, how the evolution of the universe dictates the evolution of galaxies uh, through all of the microphysics that we've talked about. Then we'll come back and look at the TNG simulation uh, to bring this back and place this in the local context. Um, so we have down here the dark matter particles of a single around a single galaxy. This is a halo. These are individual dark matter subhalos kind of flowing in here. This is gas flowing into the galaxy. These are the stars in the galaxy. This is the neutral gas as it's gathering together. And you can see material sort of flows in. It's flowing in off axis a little because those dark matter halos have a little angular momentum. Uh, the material is building up into a progressively better organized uh, disk as the angular momentum uh, sort of stabilizes it. And by redshift about 1.7 or so, we see a nicely spinning stellar disk that looks a lot like a Milky Way-like system. And so we'll sort of spin around and take a look at that, but recognize that it is not in isolation. This gas connects it to the environment, to the group of galaxies, and to the cluster all around it. Uh, so we're sort of seeing all of this stuff together. Notice the star formation here is, on average, uh, it rises and falls a little bit, but on the average trend is it will start to sort of drop down over the course of time as this galaxy becomes more state, like it get, gets less gas fed and sort of stabilizes over the course of time. So again, we can sort of see the emergence of a single galaxy playing out into so we get something that looks very representative of what we think a Milky Way looks like today. Stuff's constantly falling into and blowing out of this uh, system. This doesn't focus on the feedback as much. We get minor mergers like the LMC about to splat in here. Uh, but yeah, we get a um, good representation and can kind of tell a good story of galaxy evolution uh, from cosmological dawn all the way through to the present day. So to summarize, you know, the entire course or something, uh, this gives us a picture where we sort of see the different galaxies that come today, uh, really set by the initial uh, density fluctuations that come out of the Big Bang, the Sigma-8 and all that. Uh, that sort of says how dark matter is collapsing at the earliest times. And then we can forward bottle that and propagate, and we see the collapse of dark matter into halos, and gas falls down into those halos where it has enough pressure that it will cool on a short time scale. Depending on the angular momentum of that halo, uh, you will get two different states. If you don't have a lot of angular momentum, the gas will kind of fall down and undergo efficient collapse and star formation uh, into kind of a more spheroidal system. If the angular momentum of the halo is rather high, uh, gas comes in with high angular momentum and it stabilizes into a disk and needs to undergo kind of accretion disk-like mechanisms to sink into the middle and form a sort of stable di uh, disk of a galaxy. And so uh, as these uh, two cases play forward, uh, a star forming disk galaxy will emerge from a high angular momentum state and a uh, spherical collapse will lead to a bright starburst, typically around redshift two, uh, and then form a spheroidal system. 
Uh, those spheroidal systems can have ongoing gas accretion, and then we can end up with like a bulge disk system, much like we see here in the Milky Way, where we have the center of the galaxy formed at redshift 2, and then the disk of the galaxy has kind of formed afterwards from material coming in and accreting into this disk form. The um, If we don't have ongoing uh, gas accretion, we end up with nice elliptical systems. So uh, these spheroidals don't build up a disk in any way, and we see the ellipticals that we do. Star-forming galaxies can actually get turned into spheroidals if they are in a cluster or other place and have a major merger and a starburst system, uh, which can lead to either ellipticals or bulge disk systems, much like uh, you know the Milky Way. Otherwise, uh, you can get a massive disk without a significant uh, bulge, and then disk and bar instabilities can build up, which will drive and build up the random motions, creating a spheroid at the center of the galaxy. And we can end up, again, in a bulge disk situation. Or if we don't develop instabilities uh, through the, you know, with a bar showing up, it will remain just a pure disk system. And so from start to finish now, we can kind of tell a story about how we get the different types of galaxies that we get and all of the fundamental processes that uh, give us the um, uh, that, that give us the galaxies we see today. So good job everyone. Let's call it a day. Oh oh wait there's more. So uh yeah this is why I taught last year, and I ended the course there. But since that time, the James Webb Space Telescope turned on and started commissioning data and collected a bunch of observations of uh, very distant galaxies. And it has given us some pause. So uh, this is a new infrared space telescope. You no doubt have heard about it. Uh, it launched in December of 2021, produced results all last year and through the beginning of this year, which is 2023 um, at the time of recording. And uh, yeah, it is one of the things it's observing is the distant universe. And it's observing systems that look like this. This is a uh, gravitationally lensed, uh, lensing cluster system called Abel 2744. And uh, if you observe this system, you see in the background these tiny little red smudges. And we're observing gravitationally lensed systems, or they are, uh, observing these gravitationally lensed systems because they are uh, magnifying the light of galaxies behind it. And so it can really uh, make something visible in the distant universe that is not otherwise easy to see. And so this cluster found these tiny little spots of light here. And they are quite red in the infrared colors of the um, image. So. What we're seeing here is the light from high redshift galaxies, and we mean very high redshift. This is 10 to 12, so these are 300 to 500 million years after the Big Bang. And the thing that we look for that gives us a clue is what these systems are is the absorption due to neutral hydrogen in stellar atmospheres. Uh, so Way back in the beginning of the class, we made the case that unresolved stellar populations have a very sharp drop in their light at 91.2 nanometers. And this is a, so what we call the Lyman continuum. It's associated with the N equals one to infinity, the ionization energy of neutral hydrogen. And that gives a strong source of opacity uh, in the ultraviolet. And so stars with and galaxies with any neutral hydrogen in them are really effective at blocking light on the blue side of this light. And so young populations typically have a sharp cutoff right there at 91.2 nanometers. Now, 91.2 is the uh, red is the wavelength in the rest frame. What we actually observe is the wavelength in the redshifted frame. And so if you think about 
This is about 100 nanometers. And if you multiply that by redshift 12 uh, or more, or redshift uh, to redshift 12, that's 1 plus 12 or 13, it ends up at about 1.3 microns. Right where JWST is really good at observing. And we need a space telescope because the Earth's atmosphere makes this really hard to do from the ground. So a system will show up and look a little like this. This is a graph of JWST data for one of these high redshift systems. These are the different bands, uh, 9115 at 1, 1.5 to 2.5 microns here. And what you see is there's nothing in the short wavelength bands, and then really sharply right here between the 1.5 and the 2 micron band, pop, this little system appears, which is why it appears as a red spot in that false color image. And so we see this sharp edge between these different photometric bands as we're going along here. And so you can figure out that that corresponds to a stellar spectrum. This graph here is just this graph plotted on a linear axis uh, here. So this is straight up here. Uh, linear axis is the log axis. So it's the exact same graph, just redshifted to a point where it matches the data. So we understand exactly, you know, through what we've learned in the class, exactly what we see here. And the ability to go ahead and say, this is a simple stellar population at redshift 12. This one's at 12.63. And that's kind of phenomenal that we can now see these early. These are the earliest galaxies. You'll recall back in the simulations when we were at redshift 12, nothing was happening in the universe, but we're finding all of these galaxies. I mean, we can actually go ahead and look at that. Um, yeah. Take a look here and see. It. Oh, I want to go all the way back to this map of the universe. Okay, we're going to stop at redshift 12. Oh, we already missed it. Yeah. So redshift 12 is right after the fade in. And you can see over here, the universe is doing nothing. A little bit of dark matter condensation, nothing. And then along comes the James Webb Space Telescope and says, but wait, the universe is clearly doing something. There's a lot of these galaxies. And in fact, they have found something like 60 of these in early JWST observations. And they followed them up with spectroscopy. This is an incredibly challenging to uh, read slide. Uh, but they can actually make spectroscopic observations of these individual uh, systems and figure out, yes, indeed, these are very high redshift systems. These are the spectral lines of them shifted out here uh, to high redshift. And we're finding all of these systems, and you look at the simulations, and they just aren't there in the numbers that you expect. So we may be finding too many early distant galaxies, at least given all these beautiful simulations that I've shown you uh, through here. So what is going on? It's not game breaking per se, but it is definitely an interesting time to be thinking about galaxy evolution, especially in the cosmological context. So that's a good point for us to end our video uh, series here. So thanks so much for watching, and I will see you in class to discuss the mysteries of the universe. See you later.